Hi there and welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar, High Precision Application of UAVs, sponsored by UBLOX, Inside GNSS, and Inside Unmanned Systems, and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session as our panelists continue the exploration of GNSS positioning, navigation, and guidance for UAVs. They'll be discussing use cases, including high fidelity modeling of vehicle motion, railway and pipeline mapping, as well as environmental monitoring. Note that you'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during the ASCII expert session with all of our panelists. Now we've invited you with, along with uh, over 180 professionals from 54 countries, and uh, 29 states and provinces representing a variety of industries. And over the next 90 minutes, regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident that you'll find today's webinar of value. Before we get started today, Richard Fisher, Director of Business Development at Inside GNSS, would like to take just a moment to welcome you and introduce our sponsor as well as our main moderator for today. Over to you, Richard. Thanks, Lori. I appreciate that. Um, on behalf of the Inside Unmanned Systems and Inside GNSS team, including Glenn Gibbons and myself, I extend a very warm welcome to our international audience for today's web seminar. We're delighted you could join us. Our panel of experts will provide an introduction to real-time kinematic positioning, followed by presentations of real-world applications and benefit for UAV operations. In a short time, they'll take us from the theoretical to the very practical. And now I'd like to introduce our sponsor, Martin Strom of UBLOX. Martin? Okay, thank you, Richard. So, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Martin Strom, and I'm representing UBLOX here today. It is, I must say, fantastic to see so many people joining. I guess that's what's going to happen when you have a good panel and combine that with two very hot topics, uh, UAVs and, and, and high precision GNSS. We at UBLOX also find these topics interesting. UAV has become an, a very important market for us where we closely follow the trends and, and, and try to capture the needs of the market. And in response to this, we have just launched NEO M8P, which is a small and energy efficient GNSS module capable of centimeter level accuracies. And with that said, I think we have some very interesting presentations coming our way today. I'm glad that we at UBLOX has been given the opportunity to sponsor this event. And let's go. I hand it over to you, Richard, to introduce um, today's moderator. Thank you, Martin. I appreciate that. And I want to turn the webinar over to uh, Demos Gibri Exiaber. And over the years, Demos has helped develop and moderate many inside GNSS webinars, and he is especially close uh, to today's topic. Demos is an associate professor of aerospace engineering and mechanics at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus. His research deals with the design of multi sensor navigation and attitude determination systems for aerospace vehicles. Recently, Demos' work is focused on multi-sensor solutions for operations in GNSS-stressed and GNSS-denied environments, including the use of such systems on unmanned vehicles. Demos, thank you for joining us again to, for today's event. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, glad that all of you could join us this afternoon for or this today for this very uh, interesting topic on RTK and UAVs and high precision. Uh, with that, let's before we get started, let's uh, take a quick poll. And uh, Lori, if you could put the first poll up. Absolutely. Coming up on your screen is that first poll, and uh, we'd like to hear from each of you for your small UAV operations, the centimeter level precision afforded by real time kinematic or RTK GNSS is. It's absolutely necessary, an unnecessary luxury, too crude, perhaps not enough, or a myth. So it uh, looks like our front runner there, 71% coming in with an absolute necessity, 18% unnecessary luxury, 5% saying too crude, and 6% saying a myth. Uh, Demos, any thoughts there? 
All right, so for the last three, unnecessary luxury, true, crude, and a myth, I hope today's presentations will actually change your mind on that uh, because we have some really nice presentations showing you how RTK is really useful in UAV applications. With that, let me move over to introducing our first panelist here that will uh, 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 talk to us today, and that's uh, Professor Steve Waslander, who's an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical and Mechatronics Engineering at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. He started his career as a control system analyst for Pratt & Whitney and then received his master's and PhD from Stanford University in Aeronautics and Astronautics. After joining the University of Waterloo in 2008, he founded the Waterloo Autonomous Vehicles Laboratory, or the Wave Lab, where he works in the areas of autonomous aerial and ground vehicles, simultaneous localization and mapping, nonlinear estimation and control, and multi-vehicle systems. Steve? Thanks so much for having me, Nomos. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk quite a bit about uh, precise positioning for UAVs. And uh, what we're going to do essentially is try to walk through uh, the capabilities of these systems and how they relate to uh, the applications that, uh, that we're going to use them for. So starting off with the motivation, we see some beautiful examples here of data collected from different UAVs uh, using both regular and RTK GPS solutions. Uh, so the first one we have is a 3D re reconstruction of a large uh, monument. Uh, another one would be detailed inspection of transmission towers looking for uh, corrosion. The third is an uh, aerial view of uh, agricultural fields, looking at uh, plant health, and then finally large-scale mapping uh, of, uh, of environments from the air. And in all these cases, essentially what we're doing is we're collecting uh, visual or uh, multispectral information from a distant viewpoint and trying to aggregate that information into a common view over a collection of uh, 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 images. Uh, and this process is significantly aided when you know exactly where the pictures were taken from uh, or where the images were collected. Um, and so the RTK GPS solutions that we'll be talking about today are a big step forward in uh, getting that precise starting point and improving the output of the overall process. So uh, my role today is really to uh, go through the, 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 the details of positioning um, and where the air sources come from in this process so that we can look at uh, the benefits of going to uh, these more complicated solutions. So going to the basics again, we're talking about GNSS, which is a satellite-based positioning system. And so we're receiving a range measurement to, uh, to a receiver from the satellites that essentially uh, measures the distance or the, the length of time uh, that a signal travels through space in order to arrive at the receiver. And that uh, true range that we're actually trying to measure is not what's actually measured by the receiver, of course. We measure a pseudo range, which is corrupted by a whole set of noise sources. The first being uh, sources, sources related to the satellite, so clock uh, errors and position estimate errors. Uh, the second being related to the atmosphere, so ionospheric and tropospheric disturbances, and then finally those errors related to the receiver itself, so the receiver clock bias, the unknown position is what we're solving for, and then finally the measurement errors and multipath errors on the receiver itself. So when we put all those together, we end up with, and I apologize, I had to put at least a couple of equations in since I'm a faculty member, I got to keep teaching. Um, uh, so we'll have this one equation here to describe the nonlinear measurement model of uh, a pseudo range measurement. And so for satellite K uh, to receiver U, uh, the measurement equation is comprised of the following four pieces. First off, we have the actual range between the satellite and the receiver. Then we have the uh, clock errors or, or distances, so the B for the bias on the receiver, and then the second term for the satellite error. Um, we then have the atmospheric, so ionospheric and tropospheric errors, and finally multipath and other errors as well. And so the process of coming up with a position solution for a receiver is that of stacking multiple individual measurements from satellites and forming a nonlinear least squares estimation problem. Um, and so we combine this set of pseudo range measurements to form this estimate and simultaneously estimate the XYZ position and the clock bias on the receiver. Um, we can, of course, augment this simple nonlinear least squares problem with temporal knowledge, so uh, with some sort of knowledge of how the receiver is moving, especially if it's in a UAV where we have a fairly reasonable model of how the UAV will uh, move. Um, and we can also integrate additional measurement channels such as inertial and wheel odometry uh, to further refine the solutions. 
Um, so that if we stack up all the errors within the GPS uh, system, and this is one particular example of a GNSS, obviously, um, we can look at what's called the user equivalent range error. So the individual contributions in error to the overall pseudo range measurement. Uh, so for the civilian code, CA code of GPS, we get about plus or minus three er meters of error simply from the signal arrival from the measurement itself. And the more precise military code, the P code, uh, has a 10, um, a tenfold improvement over the civilian code in terms of its measurement accuracy, so only 0.3 meters of error. Um, ionospheric effects for scale give you an error of about 5 meters. Ephemeris can add 2.5 meters of additional error. The satellite clocks uh, add about 2 meters of additional error. Multipath can affect this uh, uh, URE by um, uh, as much as a meter. And then finally, tropospheric effects are in the range of half a meter. And so when you aggregate all of these error sources and combine them in an RMS manner, you get a 6.7 uh, meter error on an individual pseudo range measurement. Um, and then relating that through the position dilution of precision, you can come up with a position estimate, uh, so a standard deviation for how reliable your current uh, positioning solution is. Um, so to improve on this stack of errors, essentially, uh, th there's many different um, uh, procedures, but they all essentially try to eliminate those individual error sources. And so the first methods that we'll consider are the uh, SBAS and PPP type methods. So SBAS is a satellite-based augmentation system, such as WAS or EGNOS uh, in North America and Europe. And what these systems do, essentially, is collect information at a set of base stations with known locations uh, that define a model for the ionospheric, tropospheric errors, the clock errors, and the ephemeris uh, errors, and broadcast those over large regions uh, that can then be received by uh, the GPS receivers, and um, uh, those errors can be removed. Um, so this works well for the sort of large-scale errors that are well modeled uh, from a f finite set of base stations, but as you get to the tropospheric errors, which are local and rapidly varying, these models tend to have difficulty. And so the SBAS uh, and PPP type methods tend to uh, have limited overall maximum performance based on uh, the quality with which they can predict and remove those error sources. So to get to the next level of accuracy, to get from the, the accuracies for PPP and SBAS down to uh, uh, the centimeter level, as we were describing in today's webinar, uh, we need to move on to an additional technology, and that's known as carrier phase differential GPS. Uh, so the way this works is for a typical L1 code um, in the GPS constellation, uh, the code itself has a wavelength of about 300 meters. And so an individual measurement uh, in terms terms of resolution is capped based on that wavelength. Um, but it is possible to actually track uh, the position along the carrier wavelength as well, which has a maximum wavelength of 19 centimeters. And so therefore, the resolution or the precision with which we can actually measure uh, that range uh, is significantly increased when we measure it along the carrier wavelength. Uh, the big challenge, of course, is that it's unclear how many wavelengths there are between the satellite and the receiver when you start talking about 19 centimeter uh, wavelengths. And so my second equation is here. This is the carrier phase measurement equation. So we restate the same problem we had uh, in the code phase solution. So once again, we have a pseudo range from satellite K to the receiver U, and that is dependent on the range between the satellite and the receiver. The same clock errors that we saw in the previous uh, uh, formulation, ionospheric and tropospheric effects are there again, and the multipath and measurement errors are included here as well, but we now have this additional term, this integer ambiguity, which literally defines the number of wavelengths between the satellite and the receiver. And this is a hard number to estimate. Um, and so it leads to uh, a technical challenge in terms of integer ambiguity resolution that's required in order to use uh, carrier phase measurements. Um, so how can we resolve this issue? We've got um, noise sources or error sources on the scale are significantly larger even than the actual wavelength of uh, the carrier phase. And so it's actually quite challenging to try to use those measurements directly. And instead, what we can do is we can use a differencing technique uh, known as double differencing in order to remove all of those um, 
uh, errors that are common between multiple measurement points and uh, allow us to resolve the integers and then come up with a much more precise position relative to a base station. And so the way that works is for an individual single difference from one satellite, we'll have a base station and a UAV, and the difference between those two measurements will define uh, a measurement of that baseline X U sub B. And if we do that twice for a second satellite as well, we can actually eliminate uh, base clock errors, uh, satellite errors, and, and ionospheric and tropospheric effects within the range of that base station where those uh, uh, errors are uh, consistent between the two receivers. Um, and so this leads us to methods uh, called RTK and PPS, uh, which take advantage of this double difference technique in order to come up with accurate estimates of the relative position. So what does RTK stand for? Well, RTK is a real-time kinematic uh, um, GPS solution. And really what that means is that we're in real time estimating the relative position between the base station and the receiver. And we tend to use extended common filtering techniques uh, for that real-time update. Um, so to do this, of course, we need information from the base station. So we need to transmit that information from the base station to the receiver. And if that connection is lost, we have to revert to some other um, uh, precise uh, GPS methods, so PPP or SBAS, in order to come up with estimates on board the vehicle of its motion relative to the base station. Um, the alternative is to not worry about that real-time live link between the base station and the receiver and instead to post-process all the information um, and apply these corrections offline to the positions measured. And so this only requires a base station to record its uh, local measurements and similarly the UAV as well. And so this eliminates the need for a live link between the base station and the UAV, um, but uh, requires or, or doesn't allow or doesn't afford access to that high accuracy position during flight. And so essentially both of these are excellent options for uh, uh, GPS uh, solutions for uh, UAVs. It depends on whether or not you need that information in real time on board the vehicle uh, for control purposes. So to stack up what we've talked about so far, um, basically we have uh, all of the technologies in terms of the relative baselines uh, for the differential methods and uh, the accuracies that can result uh, on this plot here. And so you can see that baseline GNSS system is on the order of 5 to 10 meters in error, uh, whereas corrections when applied on the uh, large scale, so both SBAS and PPP, can bring us down to one meter and to about 10 centimeters uh, respectively. Uh, when we switch to differential um, solutions, we can see for differential GNSS, uh, where we're working on the code phase between a base station and a receiver, we get roughly uh, equivalent performance to SBAS out to about a thousand kilometers of range. And the real winner here, or the, the really precise uh, option is RTK slash PPK, uh, where we can get down to centimeter level accuracy on 10 kilometer baselines and about 5 to 10 centimeter accuracy as we get out to 50 kilometer baselines. Um, so in addition to this precise uh, uh, position solution uh, of uh, equal importance, uh, particularly for UAVs with uh, high variability in their orientation, is an estimate of the orientation of the camera system or the UAV itself uh, when it's collecting the information that it's gathering. And so we've got a huge explosion here in terms of the types of devices that are now available and a huge reduction in the costs of these systems uh, and, and the accuracies for the same cost uh, going forward. And of course, these fall into two main categories. The first would be the MEMS devices. So uh, these are accurate to about one to 3,000 degrees per hour, depending on the quality. And these consist of gyroscopes, accelerometers, and magnetometers, as you would find in your cell phone. Um, uh, these Technologies are continuously improving and becoming more stable and more reliable in terms of their estimation, um, but there's a whole other level when we move into ring laser gyros and fiber optic gyroscopes uh, in order to do the same measurements. So uh, the ring laser gyros are a military grade uh, device and uh, they directly measure the accumulated rotation and fiber optic gyros um, uh, tend to measure uh, the uh, orientation or the rate of change of orientation but do it very accurately. Uh, and so with these 
two technologies, you can significantly improve your, your orientation or your pointing accuracy uh, in terms of using the information collected. Um, and then finally, it's also possible to tightly couple GNSS and INS solutions into a single platform, uh, and this can aid dramatically in tracking of uh, satellites into ambiguity resolution, and the measurement fusion ultimately and estimation accuracy can be significantly pr improved as a result. Um, so this leads me to uh, the final summary, which is that we really see GNSS as the center of a large sensor fusion problem on board UAVs. Um, so combining it with inertial measurement uh, information and with a map information uh, in the operating environment uh, is a uh, all uh, in uh, absolute measurement information, and all of this can be uh, used to track the vehicle irrespective of what the the vehicle sees in the environment. Um, but we can, of course, also also use uh, ultrasonic radar, LIDAR, and vision or multispectral information uh, to track the environment around us and it also improve uh, our position and orientation estimation. And so this fusion process that's now more and more being integrated into UAVs uh, depends on two pieces and that is first determining the individual validity of all the measurements, uh, so whether or not they're currently useful measurements and properly capturing the state of the vehicle, and then finally combining all of those measurements so as to minimize the state and certainty of the estimation process. And so with that, uh, I'll pass it back to our moderator and uh, thanks for listening. All right, uh, thank you, Steve. So let's move on to our next panelist and let me introduce him. Uh, our next panelist is um, uh, Bastian Mancini, uh, who started his career at CNES, the French Space Agency, uh, in charge of trajectory and flight safety systems for the Ariane launcher. Uh, and he was in charge of the qualification for the Soyuz launch pad in French Guiana. Uh, after seven years of uh, work experience there, he uh, left that and created uh, Dell Air Tech uh, with some friends that uh, he knew from university. And the company was founded in 2011. Uh, Dell Air Tech grew to 50 people and was the first company in France to be granted the Beyond uh, Visual Line of Sight uh, certificate for operating the DT-18 fixed wing mini UAV. He has uh, worked in the development of ground control station, telecom payload, and in charge of regulatory matters for uh, uh, Dell Air Tech and their UAV products. With that, Bastian. Well, thanks very much, uh, Demos, for the introduction. Thanks to uh, uh, Ublox for inviting us uh, to this uh, presentation. So I'm going to show you a bit uh, what we do at uh, Dell Air Tech. Uh, we are a company that was uh, created in 2011 in uh, Toulouse. Uh, we are now uh, about 50 people and uh, we have about uh, 2 million euros of uh, sales revenues. We developed our companies on um, <clears throat> uh, developing fixed wing UAVs for industrial applications. And now we've sold in about uh, 30 to 35 countries our, our products. So <clears throat> our first product was uh, this one. It's the DT-18, which was uh, the first uh, UAV to be granted beyond visual line of sight certificate. Uh, in France and I, I think uh, around the world. Uh, so it's a two kilograms uh, fixed wing UAV uh, that can fly 100 kilometers um, and it can fly for two hours. Uh, this, uh, this plane has uh, several options. It's uh, initially designed to, um, to do inspections over pipelines, power lines, uh, other linear infrastructures, but it can also be used for uh, topographic mapping, uh, agriculture, uh, monitoring. We, we will see this a bit uh, later on. And so for precision topography, uh, it has a PPK option, and we can also put a 3G or 4G modem into it uh, to improve communications. Um, <clears throat> after developing this product, we developed another one, the DT26 which is just here, uh, which is 15 kilograms and uh, is designed to, uh, to carry heavier payloads in order to have more quality uh, data. Uh, and it's been used uh, for surveillance, uh, for example, by the French uh, railway uh, company. And it can be used also for monitoring uh, or inspection or topography, but with bigger payloads and therefore it can, co it can cover more area or with uh, more quality. One feature which is interesting on that one for navigation people is that uh, it's been uh, well, it's been financed by the French Ministry of Defense, and one uh, thing that they have interest in is uh, managing to um, to um, 
uh, use camera uh, for navigation. So in case of loss of uh, GNSS system, we, we use the camera to navigate with this, uh, this plane. Um, <clears throat> and after developing those two planes, actually, we realized that our customers had uh, another problem. It was uh, processing the data. So we've developed a third tool, which is called uh, Dollar Analytics. Uh, and it can allow um, uh, several kind of uh, characters to, to work uh, with our data. So there is a customer uh, which can uh, ask for a mission to be made. Uh, there is a pilot and there are uh, operators, people that can do quality checks or do some business analysis. Uh, therefore, uh, a customer can draw uh, through an interface an area which he wants to be inspected or have a topography map or anything. Uh, the information is received by a, a pilot that can fly the UAV. Actually, the platform can um, uh, can also uh, receive uh, data from satellite imagery or plane imagery. All of the data is remotely processed, and there are some uh, operators that, can, as I said, can do some quality check, also do some business analysis depending on the application, uh, whether it be power line, agriculture, topography, or anything. And all the results are published to the customer. Uh, so now if we go a bit more into details on our PPK solution, uh, we use a GNSS receiver, which is a dual band, uh, and it's coupled tight with a um, high-end IMU. It's connected on board with uh, an industrial uh, global shutter camera, which gives, uh, which gives very good quality imagery. And what's important there is that the time stamping is very precise, so it's less than 10 microseconds. And when you do operations like this on the ground, uh, the pilot, what he needs to know is whether the, the data has been acquired correctly in real time. Therefore, the pictures are sent in real time by the global shutter camera uh, to the ground control station, and the operator can see in real time the quality of the images. He can check the histograms in real time. You can see the footprint of each image uh, to see if the area has been covered. And you also has uh, on the top right corner uh, quality uh, check status of the PPK uh, system. And therefore, uh, the, the operator with this system uh, has the real uh, estimation in real time of the quality of the data acquired. <clears throat> we have also uh, a solution uh, that can uh, send the RTK corrections in real time through the 3G modem. But it's not the solution we put uh, uh, the, the first uh, solution for us because um, anyway the images have to be post-processed uh, right now in order to have a topographic map. Uh, the images are post-processed in the Dollar Analytics platform as I should. Therefore, what's really important for the pilot in real time is uh, knowing that the data is uh, of good quality, but having the RTK is not uh, <coughs> really essential to, for our applications. And now if we go to the, to the results of our data, uh, for example, here on a typical data set with our PPK solution, uh, so we have uh, for the GNSS receiver an accuracy of uh, six to nine millimeters in X, Y, Z uh, on board. So that's the position of the mobile UAV. <clears throat> and now if we look at the, the accuracy of uh, the, uh, the results, which is an auto photo or a, a digital terrain model, the absolute accuracy without any ground control point, only uh, by checking uh, checkpoints, is uh, around two centimeters is in X and Y and around nine centimeters in Z. Uh, this, uh, this very big accuracy, I mean very great accuracy, uh, makes it uh, irrelevant to use uh, ground control points and therefore the operations are faster. And also because we have an onboard IMU, very precise, uh, we don't need to have a, a big lateral overlap and therefore our system can uh, cover bigger areas it flies two hours, so it already can uh, cover big areas. But by reducing the, um, the lateral overlap necessary to fly, uh, we can really achieve a great efficiency to, to do uh, big missions that I will show in the next part of the presentation. And now I give it back to Demos. All right. Uh, thank you, Bastian. 
All right, so right now we're going to take a, uh, a pause here and uh, allow you, the audience, to ask some questions of our panelists, and questions have been coming in, so uh, keep them coming in. Uh, the first question is going to be for, um, I'm going to pose this to uh, Martin, it's uh, for you, and uh, this question is, uh, for these type of applications, would not PPP P be better than RTK, uh, can you say anything about the two relative to the uh, UAV application? Yeah, okay. Um, so, Morton here. I think it's it's very it's very application application dependent. Which one you you think is is better or more elegant? Um, they both have their pros and cons, definitely. Um, the, the typical problems with PPP would be the long, long um, convergence times. That is that makes it a bit difficult to use in in real time applications. Hence, uh, a local base station uh, makes it uh, can can help you get get around that such a convergence time problem. But indeed. A PPP and um, a kind of a state space representation SSR is something that we believe will come and I think we will have products there in the future. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, okay. the next one is for uh, Steve. Uh, it was a question about, uh, I guess, your discussion about multipath. Uh, and you noted that multipath errors might be within plus or minus one meter. Isn't that a little bit too low considering UAVs would be operating in urban areas, or was that? I mean, what was the assumption on uh, on uh, on that uh, on that for UAV applications that you made? The the assumption there is that not all of the signals would be affected by multipath in the same way. So, if only a single uh, satellite is affected by a particular multipath reflection, uh, then it can only affect the solution by up to a quarter uh, wavelength, and so therefore it's limited in what its effect can be. Um, but if yes, absolutely, if you're completely uh, lost in an urban canyon, then those errors can grow more significant than that. All right. All right, uh, next one. This one is for uh, Bastion. Um, and the question is, is, can you say anything about what capabilities were required for the beyond, uh, beyond line of sight operations? Uh, yes, so <clears throat> France issued, issued a regulation in uh, 2012 uh, about this. And uh, we had to, to make a, a quite a, a big analysis um, describing all the failures that can happen on the system. Uh, the mitigation means we, we've put into it, um, and these, uh, the failures can be of any kind. Uh, the analysis uh, took uh, several months with the French Civil Aviation Authority. Uh, they came to, um, to our company to do some tests and everything, and after that they gave the certificate. Uh, what's good for us is that our design is now certified by the French Civil Aviation Authority, and any operator who uses uh, this design uh, therefore, every time we produce a UAV, we have we certify that it's been produced uh, in conformity with the design. Uh, every operator who uses this uh, UAV uh, doesn't have to do the analysis again. It's been done, it's been done once. Uh, it's certified, and uh, uh, this is how it works now. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Next question is going to be for Francois Gervais, who I have not introduced. He's going to be presenting uh, the second half of this uh, of this uh, webinar, but uh, the question is more appropriate for him, so I'll ask the question. Uh, someone is asking that they have some uh, photogrammetry projects with sub-meter, uh, sub-centimeter accuracy required. How can we trust RTK data without uh, ground control points? I think Bastian said something about it, but if you can add to that, Francois. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, sub-centimeter accuracy is something that is quite difficult to achieve uh, even with uh, a static GPS, uh, static GNSS. So in R RTK won't really help here. I, I might imagine that uh, maybe there is a confusion between accuracy and resolution. If you do photogrammetry with millimeter resolution, RTK will help a lot to uh, locate the project uh, to uh, a sub or to a few centimeter accuracy uh, to to do the absolute accuracy to to the absolute accuracy of the project, but sub centimeter accuracy uh, RT, for RTK is just uh, cannot be achieved uh, right now. All right. 
Uh, let's see, next question for uh, Steve, and it's uh, about uh, inertial uh, measurement units used on UAVs. Can you say anything about the quality that you normally see on these and what's fused with uh, RTK, quality of the IMUs or an INS solution? Uh, again, entirely dependent on the type of platform uh, you're working with. Um, for the most part, it tends to be MEMS related, uh, just to keep costs down. Uh, but there certainly are excellent RTK INS combinations that are using uh, the the higher end solutions. Um, uh, this the size of the platform also matters significantly here, in that the ring laser and uh, fiber optic gyros are significantly larger than the the MEMS solutions. Um, so, what kind of accuracies are we seeing out of the uh, orientation estimates? Um, so uh, often about a degree or two on a nominal uh, inertial measurement unit uh, for, for UAV and then improving beyond that as you integrate it tightly with RTK and use uh, higher end products. Right. Uh, by the way, I meant to have uh, Bastian make a comment about the uh, previous question regarding uh, centimeter level accuracy and ground control points. So Bastian, can you, can you uh, say something about that? Yes, uh, something that has to be taken into account is that uh, uh, our systems take images and uh, we, ha we have fixed-wing UAVs, Sensefly and Delertec, and they fly at typical speeds of 15 meters per second, and uh, the cameras have an uh, exposure time of typically uh, one millisecond, and therefore, uh, if you do look at this, uh, the UAV moves of around one centimeter in uh, one millisecond, and therefore, Going under one centimeter accuracy is quite difficult uh, for this kind of systems. All right. Uh, so the questions are coming in. Thank you very much, audience. Keep on coming in. We're going to have a second Q&A at the end uh, of the uh, webinar. So we'll, we'll get to those questions that we haven't got to right now. But I think we need to move on to the second half of the webinar. So let's do that. So Laurie, if you could bring up a second poll. Sure can. So on your screen there, a second poll question primary demand for RTK's performance in small UAV applications comes from, please select one of the following, precision agriculture users, construction industry users, mining industry users, mapping and surveying, or infrastructure inspection. Okay, looks like we have 10% saying preci precision agriculture user users, 6% say construction industry users, 2% mining industry users, 66% uh, mapping and surveying, and 15% infrastructure inspection. Any thoughts on uh, these responses, Demos? All right. Uh, again, uh, I guess mapping and surveying is where most uh, folks think that uh, RTK is going to be useful, but there are other places where it's going to be very useful, and the second half of uh, Bastian's presentation is going to give us a little bit of a flavor of the different applications of RTK and UAV. So uh, with that, let me hand it back to you, Bastian. Okay, thank you. So yes, now I will describe you a few applications that we, we've been doing So with our systems. Uh, for example, here in Italy, um, there is a mine, old mining site uh, which has frequent landslide and the European Commission uh, within the Copernicus program asked us to, uh, asked our systems actually to, to fly over this area every uh, two months. Uh, and in this case, uh, the flights are about 10 square kilometers. Uh, it's made in two flights and we, we get an accuracy of 10 centimeters and we measure the um, uh, the movements of the of the land and the holes that happen because uh, because of the former mining site uh, a use case which was uh, quite interesting was uh, in uh, Niger in Africa about two years ago uh, our TT18 was used to uh, to survey uh, railroad construction so the <coughs> We did all the mapping of an area that was uh, 150 kilometers long by 400 meters width, and uh, it, it was made in 18 flights. It took four days to do the acquisition, but it was much cheaper than the, the planes. Actually, the customer who asked us to do this first asked um, a plane company, an airplane company, but it was was complicated to get the plane there. So it, it was very quick to do with the UAV uh, and uh, we reach uh, the accuracy they needed uh, to be able to, to draw uh, the, the track. And uh, it's quite nice because the, this, uh, actually this uh, railway has been uh, finished to be constructed I think two weeks ago and it's been integrated between uh, Niamey and Dosso. Uh, and it was a, a nice, uh, nice job. Uh, <clears throat> another application is for power lines. 
So in this case, it's a bit more complicated. The UAV flies over uh, the power line infrastructure, and we do a 3D model of everything that's around the power line, and we also do a 3D model of the power line itself. It has to be very precise because uh, the, the accuracy which is uh, searched here is less than one meter, and uh, what is looked for is the distances between uh, uh, trees and uh, power lines. And uh, after doing all this model and uh, measuring it with the UAV, uh, we, we do this uh, risk map. So here it's a little movie showing it in, in 3D. Uh, but what we provide to the, to the customer actually is uh, the <clears throat> this image, which is published on the Deller Analytics uh, web, uh, website. So you see it's a, a risk map uh, with uh, areas with uh, different colors that uh, tell the customer wh where he has to go and cut the trees. And so we do this for thousands of kilometers in France, and now we are working on uh, expanding this uh, worldwide abroad. Uh, <clears throat> another application is for pipelines. Uh, so in France, uh, the uh, companies that manage the pipelines have a uh, le legal obligation to um, to make sure that uh, there are no vehicles that can dig into the pipelines to avoid the uh, risk uh, collision risks, and therefore the UAV flies over the pipelines, um, take pictures, and uh, we stitch the pictures to together, make auto auto photos, and then uh, with the uh, data analytics tool, we detect the vehicles automatically, and again provide a risk map to the to the customer. Um, <clears throat> And then with the DT26, we have uh, some uh, gimbal uh, cameras that, that allow to, uh, to do some surveillance, for example, in this case, tracking the vehicle automatically. Uh, so it's a video tracking. The, the operator says, uh, I want this object to stay in the center of the image. And uh, the UAV moves, uh, and the gimbal moves automatically in order to track the vehicle uh, for, I mean, all the time. Uh, this uh, this tool can also have a night vision uh, 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 camera, and therefore it can be used for a night surveillance. And uh, <clears throat> just to show you the um, uh, the accuracy of the the system, uh, this is at uh, seven uh, almost 800 meters. So we can see the people, and we can get uh, at around one kilometer, uh, summing all the um, the errors. Uh, so, so that includes the, the the GPS uh, on board the UAV, uh, the, the IMU on board the UAV, but also the, the gyros on board the gimbal, uh, precision uh, of the position of the objects in the image of about uh, 20 meters in real time at one kilometer distance. <clears throat> and this is an example of uh, stabilization uh, in real time of the video also. Uh, in the surveillance application, because when you have a great zoom, the image moves a bit, and so we have some software that can stabilize the image. Uh, but <clears throat> maybe with the um, uh, stream um, uh, rate, you cannot see really uh, it in a very fluid manner. But the movie will be uh, uh, provided uh, after the webinar, so you can uh, download it and see uh, how it works. <clears throat> and then, uh, another application is for forestry management, so this was done in Brazil, and the DT18 was used to uh, measure uh, the digital surface model of the terrain. We also deduced a digital terrain model, so that's the difference between the, the ground and the height of the trees, and making the difference between them, uh, we managed to estimate the height of the trees uh, on this area, which is uh, exploited by a company uh, that um, produces trees and uh, wood. And you can see uh, on the left of the uh, of the image, the colors are the heights of the trees estimated by our system. So uh, you see, uh, for example, in orange, the trees that are 20 meters high. And this is displayed on the map. And this helps uh, the, the company uh, to estimate uh, the percentage, percentage of trees uh, of wood they will have in the, in the culture. Another application in agriculture is uh, using uh, near-infrared uh, bandwidth, we can estimate the growth of the culture of the crop, uh, of the corn or anything, well, not anything, but uh, some of the <laughs> cereals. And uh, with that, thanks to that, we can uh, deduce and give um, advice to the, agric to the agriculture people of uh, how much fertilizer they should 
put in their culture. And uh, <clears throat> for seed uh, companies, uh, here's an example of what we do. Uh, they, uh, they do uh, many, uh, uh, they try different seeds and uh, they have what's called micro power cells and we can count automatically uh, the number of, uh, of plants that have grown in each micro power cell and here there is a coding color that says how many are on each of them and uh, with, uh, with this they, they, they know which are the best seeds and uh, what they will uh, sell in the market in the future. Uh, coming next uh, with our systems are LiDAR uh, on the DT26, uh, the regal one which is 4 kilograms and a hyperspectral camera. Uh, both these sensors are linear sensors and therefore they need um, high accuracy GNSS receiver and high, uh, high accuracy IMU. Um, this is just an example to show that we use uh, the, the one on the right, the 5 megapix camera and not the 20 megapix consumer camera because we only use uh, industrial products in our systems. Uh, we work for industrial customers and what they need is quality. Um, and therefore, that's why we use uh, U-Blocks uh, Genesis in our systems. Uh, they are reliable, uh, they give good results. Uh, nobody asks uh, uh, the, the quality of uh, <coughs> the results of these sensors. And our industrial customers who are here, they are just uh, expecting uh, quality and measurement and not only uh, things for uh, to be nice, but they, they really want measurements for industrial applications. And that's it, and I give it back to Demos. All right, thank you, Bastian. All right, so our next panelist is going to be uh, Francois Gervais, who is a um, uh, a uh, geomatics engineer uh, and has worked for uh, Leica Geosystems uh, and as a professor at the Technical University of Applied Sciences, Western Switzerland. In 2010, he launched Project uh, RPOD, a photogrammetry on-demand project, uh, before founding Easy to Map. Um, a drone-based uh, photogrammetry uh, service provider in 2012. Uh, Francois joined Sensefly in February 2016 and he's also the president of the Swiss uh, Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing uh, Society. With that, I will uh, give it to you, Francois. Okay, thank you, Demos, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. First, a few words about Sensefly. So, uh, it is now a, a it's no more startup. Uh, in Swiss terms, it's uh, uh, more than 120 people and uh, selling uh, between 100 and 200 units a month. And uh, we have a different, we have a full range of products uh, with with the well-known fixed wing EB uh, in three different versions and uh, a relatively new multi-rotor uh, called Exom. And both uh, platforms are controlled with the same software, the eMotion software. Well, um, what is different in uh, EB RTK compared to uh, the standalone EB? First, uh, you have a RTK capable uh, GNSS antenna, uh, GPS and GLONASS on, L on both frequencies, uh, L1, L2. And uh, the geotag that will be produced during the flight are uh, much more accurate than in the uh, standalone version. Uh, the emotion has uh, the ability to receive correction from uh, the uh, base station or from a VRS, uh, so a virtual reference station. And uh, it includes as well a bit of uh, post-processing uh, only if needed uh, when the base station is located on the unknown uh, location. Uh, in the end, the accuracy is about two centimeters uh, in horizontal and three, three centimeters vertical. The goal is always to keep uh, the accuracy uh, in the range of one to three times the GSD and all that without ground control point. Um, now let's take a look at the short video. Uh, showing uh, how it works in the field. So we have here typical surveyor preparing the, uh, the EB and at the same time preparing uh, the base station. Uh, again, it could be on a known point or an unknown point. Uh, the system is almost ready for takeoff and it will be uh, uh, launched by hand 
and uh, there is here a few comments that you will be able to hear uh, in the in the video that will be posted later today. Uh, very shortly, uh, uh, there will be the landing and uh, the the, uh, uh, the 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 uh, the control with the uh, the emotion. Here we compare the the, the different scenarios that uh, I will repeat later, but. Uh, the base station uh, can be a real one or a virtual one, and if real, it could be on a known location or it could be on an unknown location. Uh, if the location is unknown, the geotags will be computed in real time. They will be less, uh, they, they, they will be approximate, and they will be fine-tuned after the flight uh, with a little of uh, post-processing. Uh, and here we have a, a nice view with the uh, antenna, uh, the, the GNSS antenna, and we can switch uh, to the next uh, slide. Voila. Uh, so uh, from the upper left uh, in the uh, counterclockwise uh, rotation, you have the standalone situation with just the EB and uh, a modem. Uh, for controlling and some feedback from from uh, the uh, from the drone. In the second scenario, uh, with the a local base station on a known point, the local the, the base station will transmit the information to Emotion, and Emotion the software will transmit with the same modem uh, to the uh, to the drone. Uh, will compute the correction and will transmit the uh, the precise uh, position to the drone. In the third scenario, uh, bottom right, uh, the base station is on the, on the unknown location. The geotag or the RTK correction and the geotag will be uh, less or approximate, and they will be refined later. And in the fourth scenario, uh, the upper left, the upper right one. Uh, the, it will work with a virtual reference station, so no base station, uh, just a GSM uh, communication with the RTK correction uh, available in many countries. Uh, so the question is, okay, uh, why do I need RTK? Um, and the answer can be given here in, in, in four points. Uh, the accuracy of the GNSS is uh, guaranteed in the field, and actually you can guarantee you have an indication of the accuracy of your geotag before the flight. So you will start the flight only when the uh, the little OK that you can see here says, OK, now you have the uh, the highest accuracy. Um, another another point is you don't need additional software. It's the same emotion. Uh, you will just need uh, the, the, to, to connect your existing base station or uh, 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 virtu uh, VRS, it's a virtual reference station service. Um, so it's the, s the same in the same software uh, like for the standalone. Um, no additional work on on the ground uh, or in the in the software, and much less work on the ground regarding a ground control point. And the good thing is, uh, when you get back to, before returning to the office or on the way back, you know that your, your job is done and that your geotag are accurate and you will have a fine processing later. So for these four reasons, there is no, uh, no question about uh, the, is RTK uh, a need or, or, or not. Um, now that the context is uh, explained, uh, let's get to some uh, accuracy uh, assessment. And uh, I could only suggest to, to take a look to this uh, white paper explaining the, uh, the procedure. So we were on a small area, uh, 0 0.2 square kilometer. And uh, with the uh, VRS uh, virtual reference station, the, the Swiss service sweepers. Um, no ground control point, only checkpoints, uh, 19 checkpoints in this area. And uh, we would just uh, have a, uh, so two flights in two very different conditions. Um, in, in the first case, ideal condition, sunny, no, no wind, uh, low flight, 2.5 centimeter GSD, 
uh, and in the second case, uh, adverse condition, uh, bad lightning, uh, wind, uh, and flying a li uh, little higher uh, for 5 centimeter uh, GST. And what are the results of this uh, procedure? Uh, in, in, the, in the ideal situation, uh, almost the same number like Bastian mentioned before, uh, we are in the 3 centimeters horizontal and vertical in the 3 centimeter range. Uh, uh, this is for the point cloud and almost the same for the other mosaic and the, and the, DS, and the digital surface model um, in, in this uh, chart here. Interesting is in this perfect condition, we, we remove 10% of the geotag just to see if we have an uplink uh, lost uh, or some, some, uh, 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 some missing uh, geotag or, or less accurate geotag in, in our block. And we can see that we, it, it goes slightly higher in, in, uh, in Z. Um, and, uh, uh, but the accuracy is the, the, the the block accuracy remain uh, in uh, in the standard uh, or in in the expected accuracy. In in the adverse condition, uh, uh, of course, the, the accuracy get a little bit uh, lower, uh, but we are still in this one to three time GSD, and we are well below the ten centimeter uh, accuracy. Is it in horizontal or in the vertical? So uh, it sounds uh, very good. So we can s now uh, check uh, two uh, projects here uh, uh, produced by, by our uh, customers or users. And the first project is a long corridor, a 250 kilometer corridor in Australia. And corridor mapping is always uh, a problem because it typically needs, it requires a, a lot of ground control points. And in this case, uh, with this, uh, these uh, uh, requirements, uh, it could have, been, could have been very difficult. And actually, um, the, whole, uh, the, the whole project could be done in uh, 15 kilometer sections. So uh, the, the, the team was able to, to move quite, uh, quite fast along this, this corridor. Uh, and uh, on only three existing uh, ground control, real ground control point, uh, the whole project uh, could, could be done. Um, the second example, is another corridor, quite long as well, 30 miles in California, the high-speed railroad. Uh, and what is, what is really interesting is the statement uh, at the end of the job, uh, so that the, uh, the job could be completed in the quarter of the time compared to, to the terrestrial uh, method and half of the cost of uh, a manned aerial service. So uh, less time spent on the ground, less money span and the, the whole project could be flown, uh, we can see here some numbers, with a, with a staff of six people and you, you can see the, uh, the requirement in terms of, uh, accurate, of, of ground sampling distance was very high, or uh, two centimeters and everything was done in four weeks uh, quite nicely um, uh, for this first project and since uh, the, the same company has, has done more projects with RTKs with the same success. And we come to the summary here and um, to summarize through the three re reasons to, to go for RTK. First, you can use your existing base station and make the connection with the drone uh, for this uh, and get the, this accurate geotags. The workflow is fully integrated. It means the software remains the same, the drone, is the same uh, like the one that you will use for um, standalone missions, and you can still do standalone mission with this drone. Um, so no additional software, no ad additional work uh, in the office, and the final result is you get on the spot immediately in the field. You get the survey grade accuracy of few centimeters and the guarantee that you are below 10 centimeters at any time. And this is my conclusion, and I give you back, uh, get back to demos. All right. Uh, all right, so thank you. Um, I guess we're having a lag on the, uh, on the view graphs. All right. 
think we're good. We're there now. All right, so uh, let's see some next steps here. Um, so uh, the uh, PDF version of this presentation will be on the Inside GNSS uh, website, uh, uh, and a recorded version of it will be available as well. And uh, we've given you also some contact information for Inside GNSS and MuBlocks, and uh, uh, if you want to go and see more uh, more information on products and, uh, and this webinar. Uh, all right. So with that, let's go to the first question, and this one's going to be for you, Steve. Um, and it's about, uh, uh, and if the others want to. Uh, uh, say something later on after she does you can uh, how does camera quality influence the precision on the ground uh, you know why is the quality on adverse conditions such as the you know things like not the per perfect day etc how does that play into the uh, to the uh, to this uh, this problem uh, sure yeah I'll start this but clearly we've seen some good examples uh, in the field of the difference between uh, clean conditions and adverse essentially what's happening in terms of camera quality is uh, the number of pixels per meter of area covered so uh, the, the lower quality the camera is the closer you need to be to get the same uh, resolution uh, on the ground and uh, the more precisely you actually measure the information or the light that's coming off of that patch of ground uh, so obviously Obviously, camera quality can help significantly in terms of improving the overall results. Um, the adverse conditions uh, that uh, lends itself to issues with lighting um, and issues with uh, uh, tracking of the motion of the vehicle, and so in both cases, those can also degrade performance. Uh, all right, uh, Bastian or Francois, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, well, about the, the camera quality, indeed, it's very important, and um, that's why I, I put a little slide about our 5 megapixel camera. So it's um, 5 megapixels today, nowadays, looks like a, a small figure. However, what's important in our case is to have a big uh, pixel pitch. So every pixel is big, and therefore, uh, we can have a very short exposure time. Uh, and therefore, the image is not uh, affected by the movements, the dynamics of the flight. And um, even in uh, adverse low light conditions, we can have a short exposure time, which is very important for uh, dynamic systems like ours. So we can typically go down to uh, one of uh, ten thousandths of a second for exposure time. And uh, indeed, with uh, cheaper cameras, they can be rolling shutter. And also, they have usually much smaller pixel pitch, uh, around one uh, micrometer for the pixel pitch. and uh, one to two, and therefore, even though they, they have um, many pixels, uh, the whole quality is very low. All right, uh, Francois, anything you want to uh, add on to that, or yeah, do you think I, covered it? No, I, I could only uh, agree with with what was said. Uh, the, the the quality of of the whole mission will be uh, only as good as the weakest link uh, or the weakest component in 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 the in the procedure. And today we talk about uh, positioning and and uh, very high quality positioning. If if the if the camera is not as good as this, then the whole thing will be a bit lost. So, yeah, this, it could be the, the, the subject of another webinar. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, uh, camera quality is, is a must as well. All right. Um, all right, uh, let's see. So this one is for you, Francois. Um, it's uh, uh, why is the uh, corrections and uh, what you showed uh, not sent directly to the uh, drone, but via the Emotion software? What's uh, what's the logic for that, uh, or what was the explanation for that? Oh, the, the first uh, aspect was to, to keep uh, the, the whole procedure simple for the user. So uh, is used to Emotion, and Emotion was ready to to get the correction from any base station. Uh, is it a real or virtual one? And we had this connection, this modem connection uh, at 2.4 gigahertz uh, that was available for uplink and downlink. And it was just very convenient and it was technically possible to send these, uh, these, these correction via uh, emotion to the drone. And it just a convenience and it just uh, the, for the comfort of the user. All right. Um, let's see. All right. Uh, next question. This one is for you, Steve, and it's uh, uh, how do you calibrate navigation sensors and the imaging component in order to get the best overall system calibration, including the camera itself? Um, and again, if uh, afterwards Bastian or 
Um, Francois might uh, want to say something about that. They can. Sure, yeah. Um, so particularly for the camera, we always start with uh, uh, intrinsic calibration based on a checkerboard or a large pattern. Uh, that uh, eliminates a lot of the, um, the errors and defines the projection matrix uh, for points in the image plane. Um, to calibrate relative to the GPS, uh, we tend to do it mostly with a tape measure uh, on the platforms that we've worked on. But of course, you can refine this uh, through various estimation techniques for that uh, that particular baseline. And so, I'd be curious to hear from our other panelists uh, what procedures they use on their platform specifically. Um, yeah, if I, if I can so add I'll, something, we oh, sorry, Bastian. Uh, um, we we are lucky enough that uh, on on drones, that all, all all the distance. Are, are very short. We we have the help of the uh, of, of the IMU or, or the MEMS. So uh, when the, all the geometry is, is is quite easy to handle, and if we can easily go down to the millimeter or maybe two or three millimeter level, uh, is it on the ground or in air uh, with turbulences and so on. Yes, and on our side, uh, so the. Interior parameters of the cameras are uh, uh, obtained uh, through calibration uh, before putting the camera into the UAV, and then they are recalculated in the photogrammetry process. The level arms parameters are known through the CAD design, so that's the relative position between uh, IMU, GNSS receiver, and camera. And the bore sight angles uh, are not measured but are uh, calculated in the photogrammetric process. All right. All right. So let's see. Uh, uh, next one is for uh, for you, for you, uh, uh, Bastian. Um, how important is lidar uh, for the inspection of power lines and making the digital uh, models of uh, of the uh, of, uh, of what the example he showed? Uh, so lidar is uh, uh, is very important because. Uh, with the DT18, uh, so the small one, it's only two kilograms, it cannot carry a LiDAR. Uh, what we do is photogrammetry, and photogrammetry we cannot measure the position of the power line. Uh, we, we do a model uh, thanks to the data that is uh, provided by the, the camera. So whether it's, it's been measured by a LiDAR or they give us the tension parameters, uh, the width of the line, the, uh, the name of the pole so we know where the line started and where it goes and we do a 3D model of the line but we don't measure it um, and, and therefore the, the maps we have uh, have the accuracy they need but the power line is not measured itself. With the LiDAR you can measure directly the position of the power line. You can also, th also see the ground through uh, vegetation and therefore you have uh, in, the in the same measurement uh, the ground uh, the top of the vegetation and the power line, and uh, that's very useful for these applications. Right. Um, anything? Uh, any panelists want to add to that, uh, Francois or uh, Steve? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Don't have to. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see the next one. Uh, let's see. This question is going to be for. Um, um, or Steve uh, and the others could uh, also pipe in. It's, it's asking of, uh, so, of, of algorithms or software used for combining all this information. Um, are common filters necessary? Are there other types of software that can be used? Uh, my take on this would be that the common filter and specifically the extended version for nonlinear systems is pretty much the default starting point uh, for sensor fusion. Uh, it just naturally fuses multiple measurement sources and prior information uh, in a consistent manner. Um, the things you have to be careful with with common filters, of course, are that the information going in is consistent or you know not uh, uh, corrupted in any way uh, in that it's a quadratic pr uh, formulation and therefore very sensitive to outliers. Um, and so particularly in my area of research where we use uh, vision points for localization, uh, we have a lot of trouble with this um, uh, correspondence problem or this uh, consistency of the measurements being used. Uh, but that would be the, the dominant way I would suggest. Uh, particle filters is another option, a sort of a, a non-parametric representation. Um, but these are computationally quite expensive uh, and tend to scale poorly with the size of the solution space. Okay. Um, any other uh, comments from uh, Bastian, Martin, or Francois? 
um, yes, so it's Francois speaking. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can only agree. And, and the other thing is, is uh, I would say that the, the quality of the measurements that we have today, is it uh, GNSS measurement, uh, I mean, the, the signal to noise, or is it from the MEMS? Uh, this qual the quality is, is much higher than what we had like 10 years, 10 years or 15 years ago when we were doing this uh, direct georeferencing uh, and where the computation was, was I mean, first the, the, uh, the performance of, of, of the, uh, the board, of the, the, uh, the real-time board was, was lower uh, and the signal to noise was much lower than today. So we are lucky enough that the, uh, the, all the hardware and the software are now uh, much better than 10, 15 years ago. Okay. All right, so uh, let's see, next question. I will pose this one to you, uh, Francois. And it's someone talking about the experience they had about uh, making orthomosaic maps. Uh, and I'm assuming this is on the US side because they're limited to fly uh, in areas, forested areas where they can't fly above 400 feet AGL. Uh, how could, R could RTK help resolve computing uh, you know, yeah, forming this uh, ortho mosaic uh, map. Uh, how, how does RTK help in that? Uh, how would RTK help in that um, in that problem? Yeah, it's 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 a well known problem. This uh, flying over forested areas. Uh, the, the ideally, you want to fly higher, and it, it, uh, all the bundlers will work better. But you cannot. So uh, the, the, the RTK will help uh, in this case. Uh, but make sure that the, 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 the software that is used, the bundler that is used um, uh, uh, for later in, in the process uh, to bundle the images together, that this software is able to handle th this accurate geotag. And uh, here at Sensely, we use the uh, Pix4D, uh, we mainly use the Pix4D software. And th this was uh, the fine tuning when we had this uh, accurate, centimeter accurate uh, geotag how to make sure that they are used at the at their full potential, and we we are now uh, we have this uh, streamlined workflow, but it wasn't easy, and there, there are not so many software that can be that will rely much more on the on the geotag and less on the on the content of the image, and this is the trick: rely on the geotags and less on the image. All right. Um. Next question is for you, Bastian, and it was a comment about uh, the endurance or the length of time you talked about uh, the uh, UAV was able to stay in the air. So it's two hours, you said, and uh, one of our uh, audience members is very impressed by that and wants to know, how do you do that? <laughs> or can you say? <laughs> uh, we worked hard on it. Uh, no, what, what, what can I say is uh, maybe I, I think... Uh, uh, many of uh, UAV people have a culture of uh, robotics. Uh, uh, we are uh, we were, we were created in Toulouse, uh, and Toulouse is the town of Airbus, and we have quite a strong culture of uh, uh, airplanes, aerodynamics. Uh, uh, the, the, the engineering school uh, to go and work at Airbus. Uh, we are just next to our office, and we work with them uh, often. We we do some. Um, uh, how do you call that uh, tunnel, wind tunnel uh, test uh, of our systems? So I think it's uh, mainly cultural. We are in a place where uh, we have the people who can do that, and also it was uh, something that was necessary for for us from the beginning because when we created the company, uh, two of the founders were working for uh, oil and gas companies and were looking for an automatic system to go and make images at at least 50 kilometers uh, where they needed to go and see the, the problems. And uh, in France, the regulation said uh, if you are less than two kilograms, you can fly uh, uh, how, however far as you want. Uh, so we, we designed actually the uh, something less than two kilograms that can fly as far as possible. And the, the result was the TT-18. All right. So, so uh, maybe I should ask a question. So in other words, the vehicle was designed from the get-go to be a long endurance vehicle. So. Yeah, is that correct? Okay, all right, good. Um, all right, uh, next one. I guess this is for everyone, but I'll start with uh, uh, with Steve and then go to Martin and uh, down the road. Uh, what are the benefits of L1, L2, L1 only, and the future, I guess, of L5 coming in with, uh, with RTK for the UAV applications? 
Yeah, so the short answer is the more frequencies, the better. Essentially, we can eliminate some of the noise sources within those uh, pseudo-range measurements by comparing uh, signals received from the same satellite on different frequencies. Um, so L1, L2 is significantly more reliable in terms of being able to uh, remove uh, some of the necessary uh, measurements. It also helps dramatically on integer ambiguity resolution, having this uh, multiple channels uh, you can actually resolve the the integers more rapidly. Uh, so in both senses, it helps uh, speed up the uh, and uh, improve the availability of the RTK solutions. Uh, so L1 works, but it uh, it's can take quite a while to, to uh, uh, recover a solution. L1, L2 is a huge advantage, uh, for, particularly for RTK. And then adding on L5 can only be better, right? All right. Uh, Martin, would you want to add anything to that about uh yeah, I can just conclude what Stephen just said. It is, uh, but I maybe could stress that uh, because this is a question we hear ever so often. It's, it's not, it's not the accuracy when you put them next to each other. It's not so much the accuracy. It's, it's not there where you see the differentiator, but it's the availability under what circumstances we can reach these centimeter level accuracies. And here, uh, with a dual band. Uh, receiver, you, you typically will be able to work with longer baselines, for example, but but with short baselines, the accuracies that you'd get would be the same. That That's not the differentiator, but as Steven said, said uh, the availability. Okay. Uh, Francois, do you want to add anything to that, or do you think they got it all? Yeah, it was it was perfect. Uh, I I could just uh, add the a bit of, of history when I remember uh, in in 1996 we we were already trying to to fix ambiguities with uh, with L1 only and it was really really a challenge. And uh, then came L2, L2 with a lot of noise, and then it's, it's all it's all always a question of signal to noise and. As, as Steve mentioned, uh, if L5 can help us, it, it will be it will be even even easier. Uh, it means we can go in even more difficult situation, and we we will have this uh, high accuracy available uh, more often. Actually, all right. Uh, well, this one's for you, Francois. While I have you here. It's a question about the RTK EB our non-RTK version of it, uh, how easy is it to convert from one to the other? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, technical and commercial, commercial question. Um, yes, it's possible to, to, I mean, it's the same airframe. Uh, um, it's not, I mean, the, the board is different. And you can you could see on the video that there is the little, uh, uh, you can see the, uh, GNSS antenna, which is slightly bigger, of course. I mean, uh, uh, going from code to phase is, is uh, means a different different antenna. But there is an upgrade path. But uh, then it's no more a technical question; it's more commercial question, and I think it's not uh, the place to discuss it. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, next question. This one is for you, uh, Steve. And I guess after you do, then maybe Bastian could also uh, 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 chime in. Um, uh, Antenna-specific errors uh, are they important for these low-cost RTK systems? And uh, what are they? How do you uh, uh, how do you deal with them? How do you have to count? Would you count for them? And so on and so forth. Uh, can you say something about them? Uh, I don't have too much experience with the antenna errors themselves, but yes, they certainly do influence uh, the, the measurement process. Um, so we've had a lot of uh, experimentation go on in the lab to try to identify errors, uh, sorry, sorry, antennas that worked well with particular solutions. Uh, um, uh, and so this, to, from our perspective as roboticists, is really a bit of a trial and error. Uh, but you know, I think uh, having these commercially available products is a, is a nice step forward, where these problems have been resolved for you. Uh, Bastian, do you have anything that you want to add to that? Um, nothing very relevant, but indeed, it's a very uh, important uh, uh, object in the in the chain, and uh, we've also had some trial and error. Uh, it took us some time to to find the good antennas, uh, finding 
the correct position of the antenna also because these um, these systems are quite small. There are some uh, high frequency uh, CPUs on board. Uh, there is a lot of electromagnetic uh, issues, and um, finding the correct antenna uh, is a tough task. But uh, once you have it, uh, it's uh, and it's okay. Yeah. I'd also say that uh, that uh, selecting a good antenna and placing it is is very important for for it's it's critical for the success. But having said that, people uh, depending on their background, I can have very different views of what is a quote good antenna, depending on the background. So we we at Ublox we we serve a broad market of various customers, consumer and products variables. And if, if if we talk with people from that end, for sure we, we must point out to them that they cannot compromise the antenna design. They must, once you go into RTK and carrier phase tracking, you, you cannot compromise on the antenna design too much. But coming, having said that, also coming from the other end, uh, uh, there are good and affordable single, free, single frequency patch antennas that are up for the job. You don't, you don't have to uh, think that this is uh, overwhelming, uh, too expensive. It is, but it, 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 it is an issue that you should um, take care of and, and spend some time making the right choices. All right. Um. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, this question is going to be for uh, um, uh, Francois. Uh, and one of the audience uh, members is uh, asking uh, why was RTK really necessary for for the applications you showed? Couldn't you have as well done it with uh, raw GPS or um, or uh, or something else? So. Um, it's it's interesting. interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. The uh, uh, of course, just to 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 uh, do the flight. Uh, I mean, the, the code will will be enough, and this is what happened with a standalone solution. And you have an accuracy of a few meters, and it's it's perfect for the guidance of of the drone, uh, and to, just to to do the flight plan as as planned. Uh, then, okay, uh, you could record uh, the, the the phase and process it later. Uh, it, it, it's possible. Um, the, the, why is why is RTK interesting here? Is is that as soon as you land, uh, you don't have to process anything. You, you are not going. You are in a remote area. Uh, you are not going to process any image or whatsoever. But as as soon as you land, you have. The, the guarantee that your your geotags are accurate, uh, and then there is no additional post-processing. So I, here again, uh, the accuracy that you get eventually after all the processing, uh, we both with Bastian demonstrated you get something that is uh, what you get normally. The, the, the interesting point is you you know that you have this accuracy much earlier in the process, and in this case in the field, uh, before going for the next flight, you already know that you have your accurate geotag. This is the reason why uh, we would prefer and we would suggest uh, RTK in, in these uh, two uh, uh, projects. Okay. Uh, Bastian, would you want to add anything to that or do you think Francois got it all? No, I think yeah, Francois got it all. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, all right, uh, so let's see. Uh, looks like we have time for one short question, so I'll direct this one to you, Martin. Um, how a, uh, RTK and platform dynamics UAVs tend to move and you know jostle around a lot. Uh, anything uh, you can say about uh, how robust it is to uh, to those uh, uh, to be installed on UAVs and used for these applications? Uh, all every application has its challenges, and maybe maybe the UAVs they they are uh, maybe not so challenging. They have typically a very good sky view, so RTK is quite well fitted for UAVs, and also the dynamics is is not so dramatic compared to other places where people would like to apply this. RTK, um, but maybe then it would be to François or Bastien to, to, for example, comment on on 
problems coming from uh, vibration and uh, other sensors going on the UAVs, if you have experience of that. Francois, Bastian, quick comment. Okay, yeah, um, uh, yeah. The, the, the challenge, I, I think, it, in, in terms of uh, the, the accuracy that we get is 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 good enough. It's quite quite clear. Uh, you mentioned before the availability of this accuracy. You want to be close to 100% of the time do we have this accuracy, and this is the challenge. And the other challenge is. The, the, the small size of everything, I mean, we mentioned all the electronics that is in, in a very small area, very small volume, and the other fact is uh, the, the cost, I mean, the, 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 the financial point of view, uh, we add more sensors and we want to keep the cost very, very low, so we, we are happy to have uh, inexpensive uh, sensors that can be integrated and, and gain this, this uh, higher accuracy uh, and at a reasonable cost. All right. Well, unfortunately, we got a lot more questions, but uh, the time is up, and we have to uh, um, call it quits here. So thank you for being with us, and I will uh, hand it over to you, uh, uh, Maury. Absolutely. It is about that time to wrap up. Uh, first, however, a few closing remarks from Martin Strom of Ublox, uh, our, our sponsor. Martin? Okay, uh, once again, thank you uh, to Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems for, for making this happen and for giving us the opportunity to sponsor and a big thank you to, to, to all, of, all of you in the panel, um, Steve, Bastien and Francois and of course to everybody that spent the one and a half hour with us here uh, to the very end. Uh, thank you very much for, for your attention and wish you all the best in your projects and and yeah and uh, some final words from you Laurie before we end absolutely and and thank you uh, Martin Strom and uh, folks at Ublocks for sponsoring today and and uh, once again thank you for joining us this is Laurie Dearman saying hope we see you on the next one have a great rest of the week bye for now